Jim Caruso, hello from uh, California. How are you, sir? I am well. It's a sunny day here in upstate New York, and we have a guest who I've known for 25 years, so he must be really old. <laughs> I have known him substantially less time than that, but uh, he is my neighbor and not yours. That's true, but he was my boss twice, so he's a two-time loser there. <laughs> well, why don't you go ahead and introduce him for us? All right. So this is uh, Ambassador Scott Marcial. Scott uh, was a longtime Foreign Service officer with the Department of State, three-time ambassador to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, to Indonesia, and finally in Myanmar. And he retired, I guess, a year or two ago as one of the highest ranking State Department officials we, we have or can have. And uh, we're here to talk about Myanmar, a place that most Americans have trouble picturing on the map. So the first question is usual, Scott, why should an Americans care about Myanmar? Yeah, well, thanks, Jim and Ray. It's good to see you guys. Uh, why should Americans care about Myanmar? Uh, first, it's a country of, you know, it's 55 million people. It's not a small place. And it sits between Thailand, China, India, and Bangladesh, right on the Indian Ocean. So it's a pretty strategic location. Um, there's some interesting history between the United States and, and Myanmar. It was known as Burma for a long time, uh, going back to U.S. missionaries uh, in the 19th and early 20th century. So you have a lot of Baptists in Myanmar who are, feel very closely connected to the American Baptist community. And U.S. soldiers fought alongside uh, Myanmar soldiers in World War II against Japan. It was a major battlefield. But what matters now is that this is a country that, after decades of military rule, uh, had a period of almost a decade of reform and opening up and movement toward democracy that resulted in a military coup in early 2021. And what's striking about it is nearly the entire population rose up against that coup more than three years ago. And initially with peaceful protests, but when they were basically gunned down, uh, began fighting uh, armed resistance against the military because everybody wants the military out of power. They, the military is despised. And that resistance has gained a lot of ground in the last uh, three years. So for the United States, what matters? One is it's a humanitarian and human rights disaster on a massive scale. You've got 3 million people displaced and you have a military that basically is massacring people, torturing kids. I mean, everything you can think of uh, on the awful list of things that can be done. So if just from a pure humanitarian and human rights point of view, which the United States always cares about, it's important. Second, I mentioned that it sits on the Indian Ocean and it neighbors uh, China, India, Thailand, and Bangladesh. China sees this as very strategic. They're trying to get basically infrastructure, their infrastructure to go from southern China through Myanmar to the Indian Ocean. They've already got uh, oil and gas pipelines. They want to build a railroad and they're building a port on that bay. They, this is critical for them strategically. Um, third is after three and a half years of intense fighting, um, the resistance, as I said, has gained ground. It's a fractious resistance. Uh, so it's not a, not a unified, you know, led by one person or one small group. Um, so there's, there's a couple of risks and opportunities here that are important. One is the risk, uh, that we're already seeing of spent, of, uh, basically exporting instability to the broader region. You already see it in the form of refugees. Uh, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of Rohingya refugees from Myanmar in neighboring Bangladesh. There's a growing number of refugees in India and in Thailand as well. Second, the military has aligned with basically some warlords along the border that have been deeply involved in the narcotics trade. Uh, meth, Myanmar is the biggest producer of methamphetamines in the world. And over the last couple of years, they've uh, diversified into cyber scams. 
So Myanmar is now center stage of the biggest cyber scam operations in the world, and they're directly targeting American citizens to the tune of billions of dollars, again, aligned with the military. Another risk is this place could fall apart. It could just fracture along ethnic lines, a la Yugoslavia uh, 30 years ago, which, you know, based on experiences elsewhere, could lead to you know, massive disaster that, again, affects the whole region. Or the resistance could prevail and you could actually have at least a nascent democracy and some stability. And there are the people of Myanmar are looking to the United States and saying, you're supposed to be the leader of democracy. You're supposed to support democracy. Why aren't you helping us more? Scott, you've given several really compelling reasons why people should care. And it, our, our, our audience isn't just Americans, it's people actually around the world, many of them in the region. Um, and yet, to, from an American perspective, it seems like Myanmar is the humanitarian disaster we know the least about. It, you know, I mean, I, I feel like we know a lot about Haiti, we know a lot about Gaza, of course. We, we, we had disaster. You mentioned Yugoslavia when that when that happened or or things that happened in Africa. But somehow Myanmar seems to fall below the, 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 the waterline for most people. And again, as Jim mentioned, you, it, you'd probably be hard pressed for, for most people you meet on the street to know where Myanmar was in the first place. Why is it that nobody knows about Myanmar? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, for one, I mean, for many years, it was known as Burma. So when I tell people I was in Myanmar, they say, where was that? And then I tell them Burma. Some people know or have an idea. They've at least heard of that. Others haven't. Um, second, from from the early 60s till about 2010, the country was pretty close. It was ruled by a military, a really brutal military uh, dictatorship. It was pretty isolated. And so it wasn't very involved in trade. Uh, there were very few Americans went there as tourists. Um, and it, it was really, as I said, isolated and not very active globally. And so it wasn't in the news uh, a whole lot, other than some people may have heard of Aung San Suu Kyi, the longtime opposition leader who won a Nobel Peace Prize uh, for standing up uh, to the military. Um, currently, I think the situation is less well known for a couple of reasons. One, you've got so much focus on Ukraine and more recently Gaza, as well as, as other uh, disasters like you know, natural disasters and, and places like Haiti uh, that are much closer to home. Second, it's really hard for journalists to get into the country. Even Myanmar journalists mostly have to operate from outside the country. It's just too dangerous uh, and very difficult to get in. And the neighbors, uh, India, China, Thailand, and and Bangladesh are have tended to be willing to work with the military junta, and so they're not necessarily sympathetic and helpful in terms of of spreading the word. And third, I, I think it's a very confusing and complicated situation to uh, on the surface, and so it's hard for people to understand the background and you know kind of what's at stake here. You mentioned Aung San Suu Kyi, who is an icon in the world of you know, standing up to authoritarianism. They had elections. She became de facto leader of the government. And yet the government, despite the huge popularity of, of her and her party, was able to overthrow that the democracy without too much trouble. Why is it that, A, they decided to do that, and B, that there's been insufficient uprising to overthrow the military. Yeah. Uh, well, again, the military took power in 1962 and ran it, ran the country from 1962 till let's say 2010, 11, at which time a, a basically a former general was elected president in elections that, that were not really contested, but surprised people by opening up the country and allowing reforms and eventual elections that led to Aung San Suu Kyi's party winning a majority. But the military wrote the constitution that's still in effect. And under that constitution, even with the elections and Aung San Suu Kyi and her party winning out, 
they still had no legal or constitutional authority over the military. So the military continued to operate as, in effect, a, almost a hybrid, uh, it was almost a hybrid government with civilians on the one side and military on the other. Um, the military has, you know, uh, not a monopoly on force because the other thing that's important about Myanmar is for decades, really going back to the 1940s, you've had very as ethnic minority communities around, mostly in the border areas, uh, but a substantial percentage of the population who chafed under the rule, not only of the military, but of the majority Bama, who dominate the military. And so many of them have engaged in insurgencies seeking either independence or autonomy for decades. So you had established militaries in those uh, among those ethnic armed groups that have been fighting military for, for quite some time. After the coup, the, uh, the people all over the country went out immediately in massive protests all over the country. Uh, but, you know, they were unarmed and the government and the military began shooting them. So gradually they began to take up arms themselves, but they had to start from nothing, right? Over time, you've seen the, the buildup of a significant resistance. It's a combination of a number of those ethnic armed groups that have been fighting for years and tend to be well-armed and experienced combat teams um, with a lot of Bama people who have joined what they call people's defense units, often working with the ethnic armed groups to get weapons. They've actually seized a lot of territory and uh, the military suffered massive casualties. Uh, just yesterday, there was news of hundreds of soldiers uh, surrendering into one of these ethnic armed groups in the West. Um, so they've taken a lot of territory. The military is, is uh, really on the defensive. But again, this was a military of three to 400,000 people uh, with fighter jets, artillery. The resistance has no jets, no helicopters, no real artillery. So it's kind of one-sided from an armaments point of view. And the resistance has actually done quite well. And I would say the momentum is with them. But the military is also absolutely uncompromising. So... You know, this isn't a fight where the military suffers a few defeats and looks for a way out. I mean, they have to really be beaten. And it's it's not easy. Uh, the generals know they will cling on to power as long as they can. Uh, but they're, they're, I would say they are losing, but it's hard to say how long it will take for them to, to fully lose power. Scott, the, the, this advance by the resistance um, seems new. It seems recent. Why is it happening? Why is why is the why are the armed groups why are the the ethnic groups suddenly being so successful, whereas before they they were on the defensive? Well, I mean, I think it's a combination of things. One is that um, you've had the the people's defense units, as I said, started from scratch. So it took them some time to to get trained to acquire weapons and, and gain some experience. Uh, I mean, the commanders of these units are people who were, you know, journalists or business people or what have you. So, um, and again, so that's one factor. A second factor is uh, growing coordination and cooperation between those defense units and the different armed ethnic groups that didn't exist at first. And the resistance actually has done pretty well over the last couple of years, but um, so it was, uh, particularly in the country's north, sort of the heartland in the north central part of the country, which is dominated by the Bama majority, they were doing quite well and had taken a fair amount of, of territory and uh, were causing a lot of harm to the military. What What's new is a couple of high profile offensives, one by a couple of ethnic armed groups up near the Chinese border that had up until last fall, largely stayed out of the battle. Um, they uh, launched an offensive in October, and it was aimed first at going after some of these cyber scams. They were located up in that area uh, because those were trafficking thousands of people, but also, you know, a major criminal, um, uh, international criminal um, organization. But they, these were pretty well-trained and well-equipped uh, um, ethnic militaries. Uh, 
they were able to seize quite a bit of territory. And then when they attacked um, one of the groups in the further south near the Thai border, the Koran, who've been fighting since the 1940s, they launched an offensive. Then the Kachin further north, right up near the Chinese border, they launched an offensive. And the Arakan army, which is one of the most powerful of the ethnic armed groups, um, they um, also, uh, they had an off and on cease fires. They've been uh, on the offensive in the West. So the military is getting hit in numerous places, plus the continuing People's Defense Forces attacks all throughout the country. So you see the military morale suffering, increasing number of desertions and people surrendering, military struggling to recruit soldiers. So they've passed, a, they, they're enforcing an old law uh, now to basically force conscriptions of everybody, which is causing people to flee the country if they can. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a, I think basically it's just taken a while to build this up. And then you get the entry of a couple of additional ethnic armed groups that previously had not been involved. And so right now, as I said, the momentum is very much on the side of the resistance. You paint a very complicated picture with all these various armed ethnic groups. And, uh, and as you noted, Burma shares a border with China. So what are China's interests and involvement in all this? It's a good question. Um, China's been very pragmatic. So they had backed the military dictatorship for all those years. Uh, well, not all those years, but certainly in the 1990s and 2000s. Then when uh, the country began to reform and had elections with Aung San Suu Kyi's party winning, uh, the Chinese moved pretty, uh, I'd say, uh, pretty effectively to build good relations with that government. So they're their approach has been to deal with whoever's in power. That's meant the junta uh, since the coup three years ago. I don't think they necessarily love the generals. In fact, I think they probably don't at all. And I think the feeling is mutual. Um, but again, it's just a pragmatic approach. So uh, China's interests are, as, as far as I can tell, one strategic getting that access to the Indian Ocean. Uh, the railroad, the port built, all of these sorts of things. That's probably primarily number one. Two, related to that, they don't necessarily want a really strong unified country because that would weaken their influence, but they want, they need a, a, a reasonable level of stability because with the current very chaotic situation, it's hard for them to move on the infrastructure and, and other projects. Plus some of the problems like the crime are spilling over China's borders. Three, I think China, China has supported both the junta and some of the ethnic armed groups that are fighting against it. They don't want anyone to be too powerful. And by supporting some of these ethnic armed groups that are fighting against it, they maintain a fair amount of influence. So they're, they're playing a very complicated game. Scott, you are also, uh, besides being ambassador to Myanmar, you are also ambassador to ASEAN. Um, what is ASEAN's relationship with Myanmar and the junta? What is it now and where is it going? Yeah, um, ASEAN has has struggled. I, I think the other ASEAN members, of course, Myanmar is one of the 10 members. Um, for many years in the 1990s and 2000s, after Myanmar joined ASEAN, Myanmar was kind of, you know, gave ASEAN a, a bad name because it was so such a brutal dictatorship. So I think many ASEAN countries were really happy to see the reforms, the progress the country seemed to be making in the 2010s. Um, since the coup, um, you, you had an effort in April of 2021, just a few months after the meeting, uh, after the coup, you had a meeting of leaders who came up with this five point consensus to try to end the violence. And it called for the military to stop, to end political violence, to begin a political dialogue, to have an ASEAN special envoy, etc. That's gone nowhere. It be, largely because it just doesn't reflect the reality of Myanmar. There's no... The military is not going to stop uh, violence until and unless it wins. And there's no prospect of political dialogue because there's no real compromise to be had here. The military insists on staying in power. The resistance insists it has to be out of power. Um, so ASEAN, I think kind of they know that it's not working, but they don't have any other better ideas. Plus, 
ASEAN is divided on this. Some of the members are pretty unhappy with what's happening and, and say so. Others say, yeah, but you know, we have this practice. We don't interfere in domestic affairs. So, and ASEAN operates by consensus. So you can't get the 10 countries to agree on a different approach. And so they're going with this, you know, continuing to promote this five point consensus. Some of that means they're not inviting the, the junta at the political level to participate in ASEAN meetings. Um, but that's, that's pretty much the extent of it. And I don't see it changing. So we have two sides who are implacable, all or nothing. How does this end? It's a good question. I mean, I think um, I don't see any prospect for the military to regain control of those areas, most of those areas it's lost or to effectively govern the country. I mean, these guys have mismanaged the country for 60 years. And they're in addition to the human rights violations and the brutality that they've uh, shown, they've also severely damaged the economy through just mismanagement because they have no idea what they're doing. So the military is not the answer. They say, well, we, we need the military. We're the only ones holding the country together. No, you're not holding the country. You've driven it into the ground for most of the last 70 years. Um, and you're doing so right now. And they also, you know, actually exacerbating the ethnic divisions um, with, with their approach. The resistance is, is very complicated. There is a national unity government, which ostensibly kind of sits at the top of, the, of this resistance. It's made up of a, a number of people who are elected parliamentarians and, and others who represent, in theory, you know, sort of the broad range of groups involved in the resistance. And as I said, there's increasing cooperation and communication among the National Unity Government, the various Bama, ethnic Bama people and the People's Defense Forces and various ethnic armed groups. And there's battlefield cooperation increasing as well. There's, but, but it's still, you can't say it's you know, fully united. Uh, what they've said is that they, they hope to, achieve, their goal is to achieve a federal democracy. They know that, that the only way for Myanmar to succeed as a country, as a one united country is to give a fair amount of autonomy um, at the local or, or state level. So I think the best hope for the country is certainly for the resistance to win. And when I say win, it doesn't necessarily have to be full battlefield defeat of the military. It would need to be, uh, what I would see is more likely is the military continues to weaken and lose ground to the point that some of the colonels and generals say, we need to find a way out and are willing to make major political concessions. At that point, it might be possible to have some kind of dialogue and a negotiated outcome. Um, and then, you know, then, then the resistance and it forces and everybody else in Myanmar is going to have to try to figure out how to put in a, you know, create a new system, a new federal system. It's going to be messy. Under the best of circumstances, it's going to be messy and, uh, you know, probably two steps forward and one step back. But that's the best hope for the country. And, and I think it's, it's one that the international community should be supporting, understanding it may not work but it's really the only viable option out there. There is a risk, and some people are, are very concerned about this, of balkanization. As I said, that some of the ethnic armed groups would say, hey, we'll just seize our territory and declare independence. It's a risk. But again, the best way to reduce or limit that prospect is to support the overall resistance uh, and and hope that they are able to create a, come up with a political agreement. Again, this is a country that's had tremendous distrust, distrust among the ethnic communities, with, particularly with the Balmar, but also with each other for decades. It goes back to, you know, British colonial rule. You're seeing over the last couple of years, the beginning of dialogue and efforts to reduce that mistrust. And I think it's, it's been very significant. But it's also not something that you can do in a couple of years. It's going to take time. Um, and, and so I, I think, again, the best hope is um, for more international support for the resistance that they get in a position of, of relative power.
and have a chance to, to then create a, a new Myanmar going forward. Um, a lot of people are wary of supporting that because they say it might fail. Yeah, it might. But the alternative is military rule, which we which has been proven to be a disaster, or kind of stalemate, which is also a disaster. So you have two two scenarios where you know are just absolutely disastrous and pretty much guaranteed to happen if they go if they if you pursue the current situation. And a third scenario which has risks, but at least offers the opportunity for real progress. So Scott, what is US policy toward Myanmar now and is it the right policy? Yeah, the US has uh was strongly supportive of the reforms as you would expect in the in in the previous decade. Uh came out immediately strongly condemned the coup has imposed a number of sanctions on the military. It's not broad sanctions against the country like we used to have, you know, 15 20 years ago, uh but it's targeted to try to squeeze the military financially. Uh, some other countries have joined us in that. There's been rhetorical support for the pro-democracy uh, movement, you know, aligned with the resistance. There's been engagement with the National Unity Government and some of the ethnic armed groups at the diplomatic level. So I think all of those things are good. My my criticism, if, if you would, and I, I'm always wary of criticizing U.S. policy, because I, I've been on the inside and know we've all been on the inside. We know how hard it is. But what's lacking is energy and, and commitment. It's, you know, understandably giving everything that's going on in the world. It's just not getting enough attention or effort. And so I think we're on the right. The, the approach is right, but lacks, as I said, a, a modest amount of resources. I'm not talking about, you know, billions and billions of dollars or anything. A modest amount of assistance to the resistance, um, you know, non-lethal, I would say, to start with, uh, financial assistance, uh, and and a greater diplomatic effort. Uh, it's been kind of, a, a, I would say, a very modest and underwhelming effort to date. So the UN Secretary General has named a special envoy to Myanmar, uh, former Australian Foreign Minister Julie Bishop. So you want to give her some free advice? Yeah, I actually I actually published a piece in the Diplomat a couple of weeks ago um, on this. Um, there's been a series of special UN special envoys on uh, Myanmar going back 25 years or more. Uh, they've all failed, um, not because they were inept uh, envoys, but because mostly because the military is so difficult. Um, so I think. A number of other people um, have, uh, statesmen and women have gone to Naypyidaw, the capital of Myanmar, met with the generals to try to push them one way or the other. That's a waste of time. Absolute waste of time. You get no, all, all they'll, they'll take the photo op, post it on all over the news uh, to confer legitimacy on themselves and do nothing. So to me, what a special envoy needs to do it, and, you know, uh, Julie Bishop is obviously, you know, deeply experienced and highly qualified. So she will, I am sure, know this. But one is understand that there's no, the environment is not right for a political dialogue now. So trying to force one uh, is not a good idea and actually will alienate the population. Um, second, in, while waiting for the environment to change, ideally with the military further weakening. Uh, you know, you carefully and quietly try to build contacts and connections with all the various players. Um, doing it with the military is very tricky because as I said, they will try to use it to confer legitimacy. So I would say you, you do it, uh, if you have any meetings with the military, you basically say no photos or I'm not, or I'm not gonna do it. Um, previous envoys have often uh, sort of ended up in a situation where they're pleading with the military to give them a visa to go into the country, and the military uses that as leverage. So you don't want to be in that situation. Um, three, there's a lot of work to do talking to the various elements of the resistance and pro-democracy groups, encouraging them to continue to build uh, 
uh, coordination, communication, cooperation, and, and come up with a, a more definitive blueprint for the future. But also working in the region, particularly with Thailand and ASEAN and others, on getting greater humanitarian access, because the humanitarian needs are huge. The UN and others have basically chosen to work through the junta, which I think is a big mistake, because the junta weaponizes aid. They will ensure that the aid doesn't get to areas where the opposition is in power. So I think there's a lot that that uh, Julie Bishop potentially could do working first with the Thai, but with others uh, to try to open up some additional humanitarian channels while kind of continuing to assess the situation and, and if and when the time is right, uh, can play a, a, a helpful role in trying to encourage uh, the dialogue. But again, it's now is not the time for that. So Scott, I'm going to ask, <clears throat> I guess what will serve as our exit question, which uh, just to, you were you were ambassador there before the coup. Uh, what was that like? <clears throat> How was it different from other places that you served? Well, you know, it was, it was interesting in so many ways. It's a fascinating place. I mean, it's culturally incredibly rich. The diversity is is amazing, and um, it, it, so it, it, it's really interesting in that. Sense. It's also was interesting because you know you had a country that had suffered for so many years, uh, and was and for the first time was enjoying you know, economic growth, opportunity, relatively quite a bit of freedom, although it wasn't perfect, but compared to what they'd had before, a, 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 you know, free press, elections, the right to demonstrate, the right to travel around, to learn, to have access to the internet, that was all new. So that was really exciting. Um, but it, it was also a time where you realized that, you know, they had made no progress on some pretty fundamental problems during the entire period of military rule for more than 50 years. So they had, a, they had dug them, you know, the country had dug itself a very deep hole. And the period of reform, you saw them begin to climb out of that hole. And, uh, you know, I used to say that, you know, they could, they could look down and say, wow, we've climbed a long ways. And they could look up and say, oh my God, we have so far to go. Because you just, you can't fix all those problems. And chief among them, are the military and its its overwhelming power and the fact that it lives in a in a it's like a state within a state it lives in a little echo chamber you know sort of detached from the reality of society so that's problem number one problem number two and related is this the ethnic identity issues for so long the country had been ruled as a bomber dominated state and ethnic minorities felt aggrieved um, and so you have this conflict. So they have to find some way to deal with this ethnic identity issues. Uh, as we know from our own experience, not easy to do, but that's really problematic. And third, and, and the, the most um, intense uh, situation involved one particular community, the Rohingya, which is a community of Muslims uh, whose forefathers would have come from Bangladesh and who had lived in in Western Myanmar and Rakhine state for, for many decades. And they were, they had been the, they had faced a lot of hateful propaganda from the military and from um, sounds odd to say hardline nationalist Buddhist monks who saw them as a threat to the country. So they were deeply unpopular in the country faced institutionalized discrimination. And then in 2016 and 17, after a small group of Rohingya carried out attacks against security forces, they faced this massive military campaign that destroyed their villages, killed thousands of people, you know, horrendous human rights violations, and drove seven to 800,000 Rohingya out of the country into Bangladesh. So that period, 2017, 18, 19, 20, all the positives that you saw happening in the country were, at least from a U.S. perspective, all but overwhelmed by this horrific disaster, man-made disaster, and, and um, hatefulness toward this community. There were other problems, too. There was still conflict going on with other ethnic groups and, and what have you. But, 
So I guess the short answer to your question, it was a roller coaster of emotions, fa intellectually fascinating. And, you know, you would on the one hand on, on, in one day meet people who were just espousing the most hateful racism toward the Rohingya. And maybe two hours later meeting some young people who were courageously dedicating their lives to trying to build something in their community. And that resilience and that courage is something greater than anything else I've ever seen. But the history and the tensions surrounding that also not like anything I've ever seen. Well, Scott Marcial is a uh, career diplomat with a ton of experience in Southeast Asia, has been an ambassador there three times, and is the author of a recent and very important book on Southeast Asia. So just to close us out, Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about the book and where people can keep, continue to follow your work? Well, thanks, Ray. Thanks for the, for the plug for the book. Uh, the book is called Imperfect Partners, the United States and Southeast Asia. Uh, easiest to get it on Amazon. Um, it's, it's a book about the U.S. relationship with Southeast Asia. It's based in part on my own experiences. So I concentrate on, on countries like Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Myanmar, also ASEAN, where I either served or spent a lot of time. And it looks at a little bit of the history of those countries, but mostly at the relationship with the United States during the Cold War, post-Cold War. And then at the end offers um, some, some recommendations for U.S. policy. So it's not a memoir. It's more of a foreign policy analysis with a lot of anecdotes um, from my own experience. Well, Scott, it's been uh, just wonderful to 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 talk to you. Uh, hope to see you around campus pretty soon. Uh, I, I try to get out there and get get a cup of coffee from time to time. So let's make sure we do that. Sounds good. Appreciate it, Ray. Jim, good Thank to you, see Scott. you as always. Likewise, Scott. So clearly, Scott is someone who knows a lot about Myanmar. Uh, lived through the transition from uh, dictatorship to democracy to dictatorship again through his long experience in the State Department working with Southeast Asia. Um, from working with him for so long, I can tell you he is one of the most knowledgeable uh, diplomatic, and I mean that in terms of understanding what it takes to convince the other side of the logic of your reasoning. Uh, he's really good at it. Um, but I, I know from talking to him that Myanmar is probably the most frustrating experience of his diplomatic career because the potential is so great and uh, they've fallen back into the pit of autocracy and repression. Yeah, you know, it's really remarkable. Um, Myanmar, even in better days, I mean, frankly, it is as long as I spend in Southeast Asia and just sort of in around, that's like the country that nobody ever talked about. It's, it, it's almost like, you know, in some ways it's an invisible country. It's having an invisible civil war. Um, it's really sort of a, 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 a strange little corner of the universe. Um, and yet of, of course there are human beings who live there and there, there are all of these, you know, he, he mentioned the, the, the world's largest producer of meth. I mean, that seems like it ought to matter to us. And somehow we just, I mean, again, most of us, you know, and I, I'm not, I'm not throwing darts here. Most, most Americans couldn't tell you where Myanmar was. Yeah. Well, as Scott said, for so long, it was a closed off society. People didn't go there. Uh, then they had the flowering Wong Sang Suu Kyi and democracy and people paid attention to her battle and her as a figure for democracy worldwide. And then the Rohingya disaster unfolded and hundreds of thousands of refugees fled from Aung San Suu Kyi and her regime. So I think it, this may be in the category of this place is too hard and confusing and far away. Yeah, I um. So, I mean, I, I, this is one of those really tough ones, I, I think, Jim, because you know, it's going to be hard to convince uh, your, sort of your average person on the street that they, they should you know, take a segment of their, of their, of their thinking and, and devote it toward this place. Um, and yet, you know, you know, geopolitically, it's actually really significant. It's, you know, 
uh, in terms of U.S. interests, if we're talking about the, 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 the drug problem in the United States, it's, you know, if we're talking about th this whole idea of, of cyber scams and all of the rest of these things, and just the potential to export instability into a really important region of the world, you know, I, at least hopefully, you know, some, some people will take away from this that, yeah, actually, we should care about this country and we should want a, a good outcome and maybe, you know, devote a little more of our attention toward it. Well, the next guest will also put a human face on the suffering over there. Yeah, actually, it's interesting because uh, our, our next guest is a person who I took, I, well, I audited a class that Scott taught about Southeast Asia. And our next guest, uh, who we'll introduce shortly, uh, is a person who was actually, is actually from Myanmar, from one of the ethnic minorities, and who's had a very intense personal experience. So, Jim, uh, that's, it's been a really good discussion today, um, and uh, we'll, we'll wrap up, uh, we'll wrap up with, with our guest in a, in a moment, but uh, it's been great seeing you. Likewise, Ray. See you next time. Well, that was a really fascinating discussion that Jim and I just had with Scott Marcial, and I'm pleased to be joined now by my former classmate, uh, Yak Tahluan, and I took uh, Scott's Southeast Asia class two years ago here at Stanford University. And Juan, I think that I was his oldest student. And as a first year at the time, you were probably his youngest. Yeah, I was his youngest student. <laughs> so uh, we were, uh, we were uh, definitely a, a very diverse group. We had a whole bunch of uh, current and, and retired military people in that class, and then a whole bunch of very young uh, undergrads. So it was really an interesting ch uh, teaching challenge for Scott. But uh, Juan, you know, uh, you know the theme of our podcast. It's uh, why should we care? And we asked Scott uh, why, should, why we should care about Myanmar civil war. But I want to ask you from your personal perspective, uh, why do you care about Myanmar's civil war? Yeah, of course. Um, well, first and foremost, thank you for inviting me on the podcast. I'm super honored to be here. In terms of just like, why should we care? Um, I think standard, everybody sees human rights issues and violations to be something cared for. But I think when you come from the perspective of someone belonging from that group, I think there's a sense of, um, there's a tremendous passion that comes with it. And I say that because I am Chin, which is one of the hundreds of ethnic groups in Myanmar. And it's like, Northwestern, almost within Myanmar. So I belong to the Chin ethnic group and I was born and raised in a village called Pentang, Pentang Chin State. And so I think just having had that upbringing of belonging to one of the ethnic groups in which we have experienced many, 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 many years of oppression has just like led to this like overweight and carry of what it means. It's like really just part of my identity for me. I mean, I obviously wouldn't be here as a refugee in the States if it weren't for the Civil War. Um, and so my identity as a human being and as a Chin person is deeply tied to the atrocities that are ongoing in Myanmar today. So that's just like a little snippet, like an overview of, to me, why that matters. Um, and yeah. And and. and Juan, I, I know from our interaction uh, that you, your family has heard, uh, experienced very uh, significant personal loss. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. And so I'm sure like um, everyone or hopefully people are aware of the February 1st military coup in 2021. And when that uproar came about, um, the military junta was also specifically attacking a lot of the smaller villages and ours happened to be one of them. And in that act, um, I lost and my one of my um, uncles to murder at the hands of the military because there was like a fire and like they had put out a fire in the town for no apparent reason. And because my uncle is a pastor within the township he decided to like take it upon himself and to try to rescue whoever might be it like struggling and experiencing that challenge within the fire and on his way there on his ride to the on his motorcycle ride to just traversing through the fire to figure out if there's anyone that was there left to rescue they just shot him and I think like I I don't know how to like deeply emphasize because I've been kind of desensitized by just 
the situation but i think really coming to recognize that like they shot him without reason like they put like they put the town on fire ceasefire like for no reason for no apparent reason it was just a brutal attack with no logic than just wanting to harm people and i think that's the logic that people are struggling to really process and so i lost my uncle just with him being shot and i think the brutal like detail acts are that's like um they stole his ring by like cutting off his finger they took his phone and so forth so i think trying to really process that type of trauma and loss at like as a college student as a first year college student here at Stanford away from family for the first time was such a huge loss for my family a huge loss for our village and a huge loss for the community and after my uncle's loss was when essentially everyone from my township decided to flee because losing one of the leaders is just like one of the most monumental things and so everyone escaped and fled um Tentlang when my uncle was shot in September of 2021 so all of those people, where did they go? So um, there are either IDPs within Myanmar or they are refugees within India, like parts of Mizoram. And so what had happened was that they had to flee um, right away, away from Tentlang and go to any, like, honestly, any of the, like, the quote unquote safer villages nearby or escape entirely to India and just hopefully be kind of like safe and stable in that manner um, in Mizoram or in New Delhi. But I know like in in the past week, uh, Mizoram also sent back a lot of refugees. So it's like, you know, it's like stateless and there's no citizenship there, but it's just in hopes of more safety. People just flee um, aimlessly. And I also went on a research trip over winter break. And that was what people were telling us, like, we just flee with no place in mind because it's not like we have an escape plan. It's not like we have a second home, quote unquote. And so what we do is just aimlessly go and hope that in any place that we find, we can just um, have that be our hideout. So people just flee in the hopes of just finding anywhere safer than where they are. And do, I mean, I'm sure that includes many of your friends and family. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, my family is included in that. Um, right after my uncle's um, murder, it wasn't safe for my direct family, my grandmother, his wife, his pregnant wife at that, and his two kids to stay there. So they fled the day after, which has been like a very, very painful process for my grandmother and the wife specifically because they were not able to have a proper burial and a, prop a proper time to process everything. So they just had to flee the, the next day. Um, and just um, escaped to India, New Delhi, India. And so it's just, and they've just been there um, since. And so that's where my family is. And it's hard to like, kind of, I don't know if rescue is the right word, but to kind of have them go anywhere else, because of course, like it's not safe back in Myanmar, but in India, it's not like they are granted citizenship or whatsoever. And so it's like a limbo. Well, I mean, obviously, Halon, you have uh, managed to escape yourself and, and, mm -hmm. and do quite well. You, you're in one of America's elite universities. What have you been able to do since then to, um, to, to, mm -hmm. to help and to, uh, to represent your people in, here in America? Mm. I mean, I, I try my best. <laughs> I think you framed it so nicely and so well. Um, but I do try my best in terms of just showing up as who I am, because I don't think that that part of my identity is something that I'll ever, uh, even if I wanted to, that's not something I'll ever lose. I mean, to be fair, I think for the first year or two, just that pain, like really, really like pushed me back and pushed me in a sense of just trying to heal from that. Because I think healing from such trauma at as a young adult, trying to figure out what college is, or trying to figure out what life is, what friendships are, and like being dumped to that type of experience was definitely very heavy. And so prior to that, I was, um, I co-founded a youth-led organization called Chin Leaders, and we raised like over 10K um, in mutual aid to send back to 
those on the ground. And then we did a lot of advocacy work, policy work. But that was just the moment in which all of us as a team were just so brought down and did not have that energy to keep moving forward because we were just running and pacing to make change. And we recognized that we needed to take a little bit of a stroll because it was harming us so deeply because these are the these are our loved ones. And so I think for a year or so, I really took a step back trying to be strategic about my advocacy work. And then now I'm jumping onto it much more passionately. Um, currently, I am with Tentlang Council International, which is focused on the rebuilding and development of Tentlang specifically, because that's the township in which we feel like has had the most harm because everyone has had to escape and they're still burning our town like now. And so we're very focused on the redevelopment of that township. And I've been going on research trips and I will be continuing my research trips in the summer there to kind of really reimagine and really strategize how we can rebuild the home in hopes that we can return home. And aside from that, I do run um, nonprofits. Currently, I'm looking, I'm looking at running or I've been running an educational nonprofit, um, which we've currently rebranded to the Re Re Refugee Education Access Development, which is very much focused on the educational system for refugees who ha who do not have any resources whatsoever to have proper um, education. So those two main things at the moment are what I'm focused on. There are a lot of random side hustles and side quests and involvements that I do, but in this moment, that's what I've been focused on. And of course, Stanford Myanmar Student Association at Stanford is something that I founded and I'm very proud to um, hold a community and a space for here at Stanford. Well, if, so if our listeners or watchers want to um want to support you and, and, and your work and, and the people who are being oppressed, where, where should they go? Honestly, in this moment, the best way is to like directly contact me because we are working through setting out the foundations and logistics so that in the few months to come, we can have, oh, we can seek out to donors and funders for our work. And so we're currently in the process of setting that up and to make sure that we can get contacted. So I think my email would be the perfect um, contact method. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll put that in the show notes and yeah. uh, and make sure people have access to that. Lon, you are a courageous young woman. You're a really impressive young woman. I've been privileged to know you for these last couple of years, and uh, I want to thank you for coming on. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you for your support, encouragement. And thank you once more for joining us to learn why we should care about Myanmar's civil war. If you're interested in supporting Hlon and her work, you can contact her at bhlon, which is b-h-l-a-w-n at stanford.edu. And I'm sure she'd be thrilled to hear from you if you share her passion for relief operations in, in Myanmar. If you are in, if you are a regular listener, we urge you to subscribe either to our YouTube uh, YouTube uh, channel or to your favorite podcast service. This is Why Should We Care About the Indo-Pacific. For Jim, I'm Ray. We'll see you next time.